that a rally in Tehran in which they burnt American flags chanting death to America. The, the, Iran has killed more Americans than anyone other than Al-Qaeda. We put every Sunni Arab country in a box because now they think they've got to get a nuclear weapon and this could be a death sentence for Israel and it could come back to haunt us. It's a much harder sell back home. The president making phone calls from Air Force One while his senior staff pitched the deal as a way to avoid another Middle East war. The United States, together with our international partners, has achieved something that decades of animosity has not. A comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Well, yes, because of this deal, President Obama has stopped the spread of nuclear weapons. Hmm, want to bet? Do we have inspections anytime, anywhere? Excuse me, what the hell do they need 24 days notice for if they aren't building a nuke? Well, all this from the people that chant death to America, death to Israel. But here to tackle this monumental mistake with me is our on-point Israeli relations expert, Philippe Azaline. Philippe, great to see you tonight. You too, Tommy. All right, Philippe, we have a deal with the devil here. What's your take? Um... Yeah, it in, in fact is a deal with the devil, which is why I'm bothered by the arguments of the alternative is war. The alternative is not necessarily war, but sadly, sometimes war might be necessary. When you think of the fact that Obama attacked Gaddafi's forces in Libya, sparking an absolute a chaotic mess in North Africa now, but he won't attack a regime that is exporting terror, that hates America and its DNA, that persecutes women and minorities and gays, that is uh, uh, destabilizing the whole region for its fantasies of medieval religion, um, it, when war is not even thinkable in that context, then the deal for sure is not going to be something that's going to answer to reality. Well, I'm glad you brought up Libya as well. We know that uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton had a lot to do with that as well. She was the point man on that one. But moving on now, talking about Iran, you're right, because even the British are now saying that, yes, Israel wants a standoff regardless because the only alternative is war. So what's your response to that? Would Israel be against any deal that was put on the table? Absolutely not. Listen, nobody has more to lose from a failure of democracy than Israel. If war starts with Iran in any kind of scenario, you're going to have a rain, a deluge of rockets on Israel's towns and villages and cities that's going to make Hamas's 15,000 rockets of last summer seem like a handful of pebbles. You can have cities being flattened, right? So Israel wants this deal perhaps more than anybody else except maybe for the Arab countries. But it has to be a good deal. It has to be a deal that reflects that you have Western nations that have budgets for defense of about $800 billion combined annually facing a third-tier country that has a budget of $10 billion a year. That's Iran. And somehow in the negotiations, Iran came off as the strong party. Iran is the one that extracted all the meaningful concessions. I, I hate when people say that, too, that war has to be the only alternative. Not saying that that shouldn't be on the table to think about. As you mentioned, we have no problem in Libya. But there, it doesn't have to be all or nothing here. My question is, when we're coming to the table, why don't we say we're going to ease your sanctions relief, but you're going to have to make some big concessions here. Not the concessions that they made, because we know that those are nil, those are nothing. But actually tie their behavior to the easement of sanctions and do it that way. But in my opinion here, we're not even forcing Iran to choose between the two. We're just giving them what they want. It's even worse than that because the whole idea that President Obama is selling that the consequence for cheating is snapback sanctions, which don't exist, they're kind of like shovel-ready project. But his whole logic for getting into the deal in the first place was saying the sanctions don't work anyway, so we have to have a deal. So the punishment for the deal not working is sanctions, but the sanctions didn't work. Overall, the problem, like I just said, and I agree with you, is that the posture of the West was desperate. It projected weakness and helplessness. So the, Iran, the Iranians were able to extract whatever they wanted because the West just wanted a deal to say it had a deal. It's basically kicking the can down the road. But what is this deal? It's like if you have a dangerous jihadi, like in Chattanooga, living in your neighborhood next to your kids, and instead of arresting him or taking away his, his weapon because you're scared of a standoff, you let him keep the weapon, but you make a patchwork of agreements that he can't load the bullet into the chamber. That's supposed to calm the Middle East. Instead, it's doing the opposite. And I love how President Obama says that he's keeping nuclear perforation from the Middle East. We know that he's not doing that. My biggest thing with this is the inspections, because Obama's touting the inspections, saying, you know, anytime, anywhere. They're not anytime, they're not anywhere. We have to request a basis for concerns, and then it could be 24 days between when the request is made to when they can actually inspect. Is this going to do anything to stop Iran from well, a nuclear weapon? 
No, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. The Iranians have insisted on keeping access to the technology that they would need to make a nuclear weapon whenever they want. The centrifuge re research, the reactors, they need to convert, but they're keeping a lot of the technology. Now the issue is the suspicious sites, right, that are not the official sites, like Fordo. And this is where inspections would be the most needed, right, where they're doing something that's a bit sketchy. That's where you want to be able to check. And there they required 24 days. Now, in 24 days, you can basically do anything. I think traveling to the moon takes eight days uh, or nine days, something of that kind. So there's a lot that can be done, even technologically, in 24 days. But the real problem is, let's say they were everywhere anytime uh, inspections. What would the outcome be of Iran cheating? Now that Obama has staked his career so closely to this deal, I don't even think with sanctions there would be any real consequences. And we know that the UN is acting. The UN is acting already without Congress even reviewing this. We know they've got 60 days. We know that President Obama and his buddy Joe Biden are really trying to lobby the Democrats here to get this deal through. But the UN is already acting. So is there anything at this point that we can do to stop Iran? What would we have to do to stop this dead in its tracks? There's a very, very slim hope on the Israeli side that a better deal can be achieved. And contrary to popular belief, that is what Israelis want. Nobody wants to face war, and Israelis will face it more than anybody else. Um, the chance is extremely slim. And once President Obama goes to the UN Security Council, which he's going to do in a couple of days, the whole sanction regime falls apart. And what Iran is supposed to do, the most meaningful thing Iran is supposed to do is get rid of its uranium stockpile. It's very vague in, in its Clause 57. It's very vague in the agreement. And, and, and so you're going to have a collapse of the sanctions regime without anything real coming in exchange. I feel like this whole deal is very vague. And I feel like it's done purposefully to be vague. So it gives them wiggle room. What's your sense? Well, generally, that's how diplomatic deals are struck, right? There's some kind of ambiguity so that people can sell it back home. The problem here is where the ambiguity finds itself, right? The ambiguity is not, is not in a place where Iran is on the defensive. It's an ambiguity that Iran can exploit. For example, on the uh, stockpile that I'm talking about. There's a commitment by Iran to sell its stockpile or convert it. Uh, to an international buyer. Now, there's a lot of room there. What does that mean? Wh who's going to verify con conversion? Where are they going to do it? How are they going to convert it? Who are they going to sell it to? So these things are a kind of ambiguity that has a lot of danger built into it. It's not an ambiguity that allows both sides to win. I think that's the problem with the deal. And again, it comes from a posture where if you look at this from the outside, the West came and was projecting desperation. We need this deal more than you do so it can get back to its other issues. Um, and the Iranians are fantastic negotiators. So the ambiguity, again, yes, is a victory for them, I think, unfortunately. Well, and besides the idea of a nuclear Iran, we've got other aspects, which you and I have discussed before. Big one for me is ending the arms embargo here. I don't think we need to be doing that. I think that that's the worst thing that we could do at this point in time. Not only we are easing sanctions, allowing more money, but ending an arms embargo, what does that mean for the United States? We know these folks just last week were chanting death to America, death to Israel. And it's not just a slogan, right? The American troops who were killed, the thousands of American troops killed in Iraq, a majority of that I would suspect were killed by Shiite militias related to Iran, or if not by the instability that Iran caused on purpose. Um, this, this deal gives Iran everything it needs to step back its aggression and expansion in the neighborhood. President Obama says he didn't want to discuss things that weren't directly related to the nuclear issue. How are intercon uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and conventional weapons embargoes related to the nuclear issue? Iran now has been legitimized in the West. It gets to buy weapons with money it's going to make from exporting oil now. And it has shown absolutely no sign of wanting to stop its expansion and destabilizing of Arab countries or of Israel at all. So I think we can expect the worst. I think Obama is hoping for the best. Well, the destabilization is the biggest and the key to this thing, as far as I'm concerned, as well. As we've already got a Middle East that most people would agree is shaky at best. Now we're going to add Iran. We're going to give them more money. We're going to ease up on them. We're going to allow them to meddle in all of their countries. We know that they're already doing so. Now what's going to happen to the Middle East? You've got a, a sectarian battle between Shiite and Sunnis. Now what, though? Now you're arming one side, then the other side's going to have to match that, then the other side, then the other side. And then guess who is stuck in the middle there? Israel. And then who's next? United States of America. This is a deal with the devil, and I hope that the Democrats, I said this yesterday, I hope the Democrats realize when Obama and Biden are bargaining with them on this to get this passed, I hope they realize that in 10 years, in 15 years, even in 20 years, when Iran gets a nuclear weapon or when the Middle East is completely destabilized, they should sign their name on that one because that's what they're going to have to answer for. Let's remind them of that right now. 
right now. This isn't a partisan issue. This isn't an American issue. This is a global issue. Philippe, thank you so much for being here tonight.